<clears throat> All right, uh, thank you very much, members. I'd like to call the Law Amendments Committee uh, to order for today, uh, July the 28th, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Brad Johns. I'm the MLA for Sackville Uniac, as well as uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I will be chairing for today's meeting. Uh, just before we get things started with some of the rules, I'm going to ask if members of the committee could identify themselves, starting with the uh, government side. Good morning, everyone. Trevor Boudreau, MLA for Richmond. Good morning. Uh, Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West. Hello, everyone. I'm Kent Smith. I'm the MLA for the Eastern Shore. Good morning, everyone. Dave Ritzy, MLA for Turtle Boggle Hill, Millbrook, and Salmon River. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Fred Tilly, MLA Northside Westmount. Good morning, everyone. Brenda McGuire, uh, MLA for Halifax Atlantic. Lisa Lachance, Halifax Sable, Sable Island. Gary Burl, Halifax Shabucto. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like uh, to take a moment to recognize uh, legislative council that's with us today, Karen Kingley and Killen Schimler. So before we uh, start, I'll run down a couple of the uh, rules really quickly. I'd like to ask everyone to please make sure that your cell phones are turned off or on vibrate. Uh, remind everyone in the audience to please remain respectful at all times. No cheering, shouting, either for or against what's discussed. Any disorderly behavior whatsoever won't be tolerated and you'll be asked to leave. Remind everyone to please do not take pictures or video. Uh, the only ones that are allowed to do that are credit media. Presenters are not to use any props of any types. If presenters have handouts for the committee members, please provide them to the pages, which I don't think we have a page, so hopefully you brought your enough for everybody. Uh, copies of all written submissions on the bill that have been received by email up to the time when the bill is reported back to the House or in person during Law Amendments Committee will be given to the library staff and posted online. Submissions that are received after the bill has been reported back to the House are distributed electronically to law amendments committee members but will not be posted online. Uh, not worrying so much about masks but presenters are welcome to address the committee with or without a mask, it's their choice. Uh, all presenters today were required to provide notification to legislative office that they intended on speaking. So we'll proceed with speakers from the list that's provided. The ag agenda listing the order of which presenters will be invited to speak will be available at a table on the side of the door, but we only have two, so it should be pretty good. Um, I would like to remind presenters if there are eight or less that are signed up for a particular bill, then we allow 10 minutes to address the committee. Um, once a speaker has concluded their presentation, I'd ask them to leave the room. That's not really an issue here today. So with that, uh, we'll start off with our one and only item that's on our agenda today, which is bill number 185, House of Assembly Act amended. We have two speakers who are on our list. Our first one uh, in person. Uh, Tim Pratt. <laughs> Welcome. I, uh, I'd ask that you uh, identify your name uh, for the record and uh, community where you reside. And Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name's Tim Pratt. I reside in Hammonds Plains, Nova Scotia. I'm a longtime resident there and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to speak with you today. I hold MLAs in very high regard. I've known several personally. I don't always agree with you, um, but I always respect the effort that you put in. Your job is difficult. Not only are you saddled with the serious problems and challenges that our province faces, the 
transformational change that society is going through at this time. But you also have to understand the details and nuances of the legislation that are coming in. In addition to that, when you leave the legislature, you're back in your communities and you're serving your constituents. And you face challenging problems that are very personal to the citizens of this province and they bring them into your office on a daily basis. And as somebody who is a people manager, I understand how draining that can be to face these challenges, look people in the eyes, and try to help them through very difficult times. When you're not doing that, you're in the community supporting community events, charitable organizations, that's your evenings and weekends. And then above and beyond all of that, you're faced with the nonsense of the game um, that you have to play in order to serve. Um, so that, to me, is a very challenging role and it deserves to be compensated accordingly. I spent some time about 25 years ago on committees to help select MLAs. And at that point, the pay for the MLAs had gotten out of line with reality. Um, and it was hard. It was hard to attract qualified candidates, not because they didn't want to serve, not because they were looking to get rich, but because they did have to take care of their families. And so when we started taking the politics out of compensation, we were able to bring the MLA salary up to a reasonable, not exorbitant level, right? For the work you do, you're underpaid. Um, not everybody is going to say that, and it's no fun to say that, but you are. Um, so I'm concerned that this legislation is actually more about the game than it is about the job that you do. And it can have lasting impacts negatively on not only yourselves, but on future people who want to be able to serve, and it may price them out of being able to serve the way they want. I understand that in this climate, it's very difficult to face the media and face a frustrated public who are facing challenges around affordability with the fact that MLAs are given a raise. But that's why this was taken out of your hands and put in the hands of an independent body. And I would encourage you to consider keeping it there. But I get that you have to face the realities of the game. So what I would suggest is this. Every employer has the ability to make before-tax donations to charities. As a group, pick some charities that you can choose from. Feed Nova Scotia, Nourish Nova Scotia, add some house, right? Um, there's so many of them. Seoul Harbor Rescue Mission. Great charities that will actually directly deal with the affordability crisis that our province faces and show that you are putting some skin in the game. Doing this addresses the challenge of the game, plus it addresses the affordability crisis, and at the same time keeps your compensation at least somewhat aligned with the realities of what it takes to bring candidates in to politics to do the level of service that you folks do. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we face too is that we know people are struggling. And compensation from the government to individuals, whether they're MLAs or whether they're people on income assistance, get impacted by the game. And if you really want to tie something to MLA wages, I would suggest that the second part of this so one, until the next election, contribute the raises that you're due to these charities. I'll tell you what, I'll do the same thing. And number two, investigate linking the, the feedback from the independent committee on what percentage your raise should be to the percentage of increase that we should give to income assistance. Income assistance has not kept up with the pace of inflation, not close, right? And 
all parties have had a chance to link this to something and no parties have done it. And that's fine because it's a difficult thing to do. We go into communities and say we're going to give more people, more money to people who are not working and there's blowback and I get that. But we've evolved as a society. We understand now as a society that a lot of the folks who need assistance are either facing mental disabilities, addiction, some type of trauma in their life, or some type of permanent disability. And these folks need our assistance, and this is why this program exists. So if you want to move away from the, well, why are you getting a raise and these people are struggling in society, in a separate piece of legislation, it's far too complicated to be part of this legislation, look at coupling income assistance to MLA increase and, and see that go up. I think you'll solve a lot of problems that way. Thank you very much for hearing me today. Um, I really do appreciate it. I really do respect everything that you do. And hopefully we can do something here that will make a demonstrable difference in the lives of people who are facing these challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your comments. I'd ask if there are any questions from committee members, starting off with MLA LaChance, please. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation and for really taking time to think about what was in the report um, and, and other, you know, more broad issues. Um, I'm wondering if you've had a chance, it seems like you have, um, to review the full report. Uh, you know, our caucus really focused on submitting to the panel um, considerations around how to increase uh, representation, how to increase diversity, equity, inclusion, so that what are the barriers that prevent lots of Nova Scotians from being able to consider this role, and how can we how can we support people to see themselves in this role? I'm wondering if there are any other aspects around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion that you um, would would want to highlight from the report. I think diversity, equity, inclusion is critical. And it needs to be brought to the forefront of any conversation. Um, in my own professional life, I sit on the Council for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In my company, I'm a champion for it. I'm a co-facilitator. I'm sorry. Uh, hang on. Your microphone's on. It, could you hit your microphone there? No. Okay, so my my uh, my mistakes. I'm sorry. So uh, I'll go to uh, Mr. Pratt. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Start all over again. I guess we we don't have people right here in house to be able to see who's speaking. So uh, my fault. Thank that, you very much, and I apologize, Mr. Is, Pratt. That is fair. Okay, so I will start again. So. Thank you for raising that. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, a critical aspect of this, um, and I'm a big believer in it. I am a facilitator for and member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council in my job, and we do deal with these various barriers to women, to um, visible minorities, persons with disabilities, and uh, LGBTQ+. And I think that is important that we put resources into empowering and enabling these people to serve and that we should not, even in the current um, climate of affordability, pull back from these types of initiatives, but we should drive forward with them because as things become more unaffordable, these groups will be further marginalized and it will be harder for them to participate also being able to say, you know what, I'm going to step out of my role and take less money to serve is a position of privilege, right? You have to be able to have the means and the financial security in your home to be able to take that cut in pay that it would take to serve. And that will put some people who have been set back through their entire lifetime by lack of opportunity to gain employment, gain training, and gain income. It can price them out of the game too. So not only should we not ignore the, um, the 
diversity, equity, inclusion aspect of it, we should understand that freezing wages is going to further exacerbate this problem. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Uh, I will go to MLA McGuire, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pratt, for being here today. Um, I think uh, I think this bill has been, or this this report has been kind of um, overshadowed by the MLA raises. Um, but um, I think there are some things that um, fundamentally are are difficult, and there's barriers to becoming MLAs um, that this this bill could have addressed or this, this committee did address. Um, I look at, uh, you know, uh, what, what is happening now is we, is the candidates that are coming forward are either financially secure, um, are retirees. Um, it's very, uh, difficult. Like I can say for myself personally, um, I had to take like two months off of work. Um, one minute. Well, we only have two candidates today. For two people today, come on. Um, but uh, the other thing is, is that uh, it's it's a it's difficult to take that time off and to try to run for uh, office. Then when you get in, you have to deal with things like childcare and and um, there's no there's very little diversity in the Nova Scotia legislature. If you look at the current government, um, one of the biggest controversies they had was they couldn't find anyone to adequately represent the you know, African Nova Scotians. And that's, you know, there's there's reasons why, and that report addressed it. So I think um, just kind of throwing that report out and saying um, we're no longer going to listen to this, and I'll be the first to say uh, the previous government did the same thing, and we, I had issues with that too because there was, there was things in those reports that would have helped address this. So um, as somebody who you said you're, is, is a people manager, um, do you feel that um, when when people take time out of their uh, busy schedule to do these reports, and then it's just thrown out the window, do you feel like uh, do, th do you think they're going to come back? Do you think people are going to want to be part of the, the next committee to, to do this these things and and um, and attract good candidates? Mr. Pratt, you had three minutes left uh, on your presentation, so I'll give you that three minutes to finish answering this question, if you'd like. Okay, thank you very much. If I were to be asked to sit on a committee and put the kind of work in that obviously went into this report, and it was totally shelved, no, I probably would not put my time back into that again, because there are other areas where I could lend my time, and, and it would be discouraging. And Again, the game, what I refer to as the game, does impact the ability to do the good. And there's a lot of good that can come into debating this report, working through this report, and finding ways to implement this report to address the challenges that have been mentioned here. And I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to be creative, and I would encourage you to be collaborative as colleagues around the table here from all parties to look at the issues and see how can we address them. And how can we address them without the game getting in the way? It's, it's absolutely critical that we have diversity in candidates, that people are able to be given the resources to represent themselves, to represent their community, to represent who they are, um, to bring that level of diversity here so that it's not just folks who have the ability and can afford to run that are given the opportunity to serve. We, we dilute the voice of our uh, society for that. So yeah, I would, I would, I would take um, the recommendations in this report seriously, and I would look to implement them in a way that can be palatable. And really, don't talk about affordable, because we all know what the budget looks like and the dollars that it would take to implement this report. Though, in the light of the game, could be staggering to some folks. It isn't even a rounding error in the uh, in the budget, and it can make a huge difference um, in how our province is represented and the kind of solutions that will come out to the very complex problems that we face. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Pratt. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pratt. <clears throat> 
So uh, moving on to our next speaker, I believe it's a virtual presentation and uh, we can see you on the monitor. Good morning and, uh, and welcome. Uh, I would like to ask if you could please um, identify your name as well as uh, your community of residence and how you would like to be addressed by committee members, please. And then you'll have 10 minutes to present with five minutes of follow-up questions. So if you could just uh, identify yourself for the, for the record. Yes, good morning. My name is uh, Jay Goldberg and I am uh, the uh, Ontario and Atlantic Director at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Thank you. And uh, you would like committee members to address you as? Uh, Jay is good. Okay, thank you very much, Jay. And whenever you would like to start, you have 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, I won't take uh, the full amount of time there, but I, I do want to speak today on the issue uh, of MLA pay as well as uh, the premier's salary. Um, I understand, of course, that there was a review conducted uh, this year that suggested increasing the uh, salary of MLAs uh, by about $13,000. Um, so I'm here today uh, to speak in favor of this legislation. Um, I think that it's both uh, in line with, um, you know, the, the average reality faced by Nova Scotians, uh, but also um, salaries uh, in other areas of the region for uh, members of legislative assemblies. Um, first, I should just note that um, the, the average income in Nova Scotia is roughly $52,000. And so the $89,000 salary is of course well above that. Um, I would also note that if you compare uh, to neighboring provinces, uh, Prince Edward Island, the base salary is about $74,000. And New Brunswick, the base salary is $85,000. Uh, and so Nova Scotia is certainly above that. Um, but I think more importantly, what uh, I want to speak to you today in particular uh, is the timing. And I think that the Premier uh, and the government uh, got this right uh, in terms of Nova Scotians facing uh, the highest inflation rate in decades, uh, cost of living crisis. And I think it's an important time to show a taxpayers uh, that we are all in this together, uh, that as taxpayers face uh, the squeeze in budgeting, uh, that members of the legislature understand the difficulty that individuals are going through uh, and that um, they respond accordingly. And I should also say that the premier, uh, the premier's decision, or at least within the bill, uh, to reduce uh, the premier's salary by about $11,000 is rather unprecedented. Um, certainly there's been instances of freezing uh, we know in, in many provinces there have been salaries frozen. There's been salaries frozen in Nova Scotia for a while. Um, but uh, to take the step to lower salary by eleven thousand um, dollars, you know, is certainly rather unprecedented and uh, should be um, applauded for that. The other thing I want to talk about today uh, is that part of the reason that you're here addressing this issue. Uh, is because we're in a time of great difficulty for taxpayers uh, facing, in particular, inflation and a cost of living crisis. Uh, and I think that the government and um, other parties as well have responded um, by you know, not going forward with this pay hike, I think, to acknowledge the difficulty that Nova Scotians are going through. Um, but I want to speak briefly on the issue of bracket creep uh, or what you might call indexing uh, tax rates. Nova Scotia is one of three provinces that does not index its tax rates, uh, its income tax rates. Uh, and so what you end up with a phenomenon is bracket creep, which is essentially, um, uh, if you get a cost of living adjustment pay raise, uh, if the income tax brackets stay where they were and don't move uh, with your cost of living pay raise, all of a sudden, people can be pushed into higher tax brackets and ultimately end up paying more in taxes. Uh, this is not usually as big of an issue uh, in some years because um, inflation is one, one and a half, two percent, 
Uh, and so the difference uh, is not as substantial. But we are facing a situation where this year inflation could be nearing uh, at or nearing 10%. Uh, and so any kind of pay raises Nova Scotians are getting uh, will not even keep pace with the cost of living. Uh, and then to have income taxes as well that do not keep pace with inflation uh, is going to be a very real concern for people all across the province. So I think what uh, members are doing today and showing their solidarity with taxpayers uh, is a very good thing, uh, demonstrating that they understand the difficulties that uh, taxpayers are going through, that they hear them, and that you are responding uh, in a way that I think shows a lot of people uh, that you're in touch with the needs of Nova Scotians. Certainly, uh, after I uh, sent a communication to Canadian Taxpayers Federation supporters in Nova Scotia and let them know what was going on with the pay freeze and the premier pay cut, there were a lot of people who were very uh, encouraged and uh, who noted that this is a rare a development of politics. But I think it's important to move beyond just uh, the important symbolic gesture of the freezing of salary, but to really consider the issue of indexing tax rates. Because again, uh, this year is unprecedented. We have not faced inflation like this uh, in three to four decades. Uh, and so uh, as taxpayers are gonna walk into um, tax season uh, next year as they're filing their taxes, uh, again, even if inflation has gone up by 9%, but even if their pay has gone up by 5 or 6 not even keeping pace with the increase in cost, but, but increasing somewhat uh, to deal with inflation uh, and uh, cost of living, uh, if we don't move those income tax rates, uh, that's going to be a very, very difficult thing for people all across the province. So with that, I would like to thank you for having me here today, uh, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We do have uh, a couple of questions. I'll start out with MLA McGuire. Uh, Jay, I want to thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I want to thank you for your presentation today. I'm actually glad that you brought up Rocket Creek because for uh, 10 years running, uh, my association out of Spryfield Health Ex Atlantic, that has been the policy that we've brought forward. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it's an obsession of my partner, Rena. She's, she's been talking about Bracken Creek for 10 years, and before that, it was an obsession of Diana Whalen, the former MLA, and, and very few people bring it up. So when, when you mentioned Bracken Creek, it brought a smile. I sent a text to Rena saying, Jay Goldberg's on your side here on Bracken Creek. But um, I, I think we can agree that all parties are agreed to uh, not taking the pay um, increase. Uh, this could have been dealt with outside of le the legislature, as it has been in the past. So uh, as somebody who represents uh, the taxpayers, um, you know, you must see how this is a bit of a waste of money for us to be here for the last, for this next week or so. Uh, this is costing tax dollars to be in, in the Nova Scotia legislature when all parties sent out a message saying that they agreed with this. Also, um, for the Premier to come in um, and... Uh, let go uh, several uh, high-ranking members of the public, uh, um, you know, CEOs and directors of... MLA McGuire, can we keep it on uh, well, topic this is to about, Bill 185, please? Yeah, this is about it. Don't and worry. I think you're asking a question, correct, not a statement, so please get to your question. Nothing in the rules that say I can't do a preamble. Thank you, Justice Minister. Um, the, uh, so what, uh, what I would like to know is you made a comment about how this is good policy when it comes to tax dollars. Do you think $1,800 a day after giving almost a million dollar buyout to CEOs that were extremely successful in the rollout of high speed internet, do you think $1,800 a day to his close personal friends, do you think that is a good use of tax dollars? Uh, I interrupt and I ask a question of how that has to do with the bill that's on in front of us. Uh, I'll go to uh, speaker or to the uh, presenter, please. Yeah, I can uh, just speak briefly. Uh, obviously, I think um, it's important that uh, when individuals are, are chosen for important positions that they're chosen based on merit, of course. Um, 
you know, I, I would certainly uh, agree uh, with the member uh, was, uh, you know, speaking about if there if there was a way to um, not go forward with the pay increase without calling the legislature back. Uh, obviously, that is um, something that could have saved uh, taxpayer dollars. Although I, I would say that I think it's important that this this move, I think, signals to the public uh, that all parties are taking uh, this issue very seriously uh, this year. Uh, and and um, that that's what I would say on that issue. Um, again, if there's a way to do it without uh, costing more money for for members to be here, uh, certainly, uh, you know, that seems like a reasonable proposal, but uh, I would say I think uh, Nova Scotians are certainly taking note uh, that all parties are here and signaling that they are going to do the right thing and demonstrate solidarity with taxpayers. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, Jay. I'll now go to MLA Lachance for a question. Hi, thanks so much for presenting today. I mean, I think, you know, we would say um, from our perspective that we're happy to be in the House because we really want to be able to address some of the critical issues that are facing Nova Scotians. Um, and I do think it's, you know, sort of well established that we we didn't necessarily have to, to come uh, together on pay raises. But there's also aspects of the report that we consider very important in terms of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we really uh, we focus a lot in our submission on the on on those questions to consider how best how and how better how to do better in terms of having elected officials that are representative of all Nova Scotians. I'm wondering if you have any comments on those aspects of the report. Go to the speaker, please, or the presenter. Yes. You know, obviously, I think uh, diversity in politics in general is a good thing. You you do want to have, um, you do want to have, of course, uh, members that that reflect the public, uh, both uh, their policy views, but also uh, the the makeup of the public. So, you know, I would I would say that I think you know that's an important issue. I, I really couldn't speak too much further to that. Thank you very much. Uh, any other speakers or questions? Uh, I will uh, go to MLA McGuire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I felt that was reluctant. You were being very reluctant there. But, uh, uh, so this is an opportunity not just to discuss uh, this bill. Um, obviously, it's extremely important um, that, we, that we have a conversation about how to attract uh, MLAs and not just MLAs, of, uh, but also how do we engage, as my colleague said, uh, different sections of the population, which we've done a poor job of doing um, uh, as, as uh, legislature. There, you know, it, we've done a very poor job of rep proper representation in Nova Scotia. Um, the when you what is the overriding feeling from um, your represent your members your representatives on how to properly attract members you um you you know you have small business owners you have uh, people that make a lot of money people that don't make so much money have you had that discussion with him on how to properly attract um, those candidates and. I think uh, this is part of the discussion that is lacking here. You know, we've seen, I'm, I'm keeping a, a running tab of how long certain members have been part of the debate in the Nova Scotia legislature. We're seeing very important members that are only there for five, six minutes at a time and, and not, not, doing, not being there for the actual debate. Um, but what do you see as the issue on why we're not attracting the candidates that we need? Uh, go to uh, Jay, please. Yes, um, very happy to speak to that. Um, uh, we focus certainly within the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We have supporters; uh, they're not direct members by any means. There's no specific membership. Um, but I, I do think that um, the best way, of course, to try to attract uh, people, I think, uh, across the spectrum, and certainly this is what we believe. 
uh, at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is to speak to issues that matter to people. Uh, and, um, you know, I won't pretend that uh, trying to get people to run for the uh, Legislative Assembly uh, is the same thing as trying to get people to sign a petition uh, or to, uh, you know, speak out on a particular policy issue. Um, but I do think that um, if you touch on the issues uh, that are important to people and speak to those issues, uh, that is a way uh, to try to facilitate uh, participation, certainly we've found. Uh, and so I, I think but you know, even through this bill, through recognizing, uh, through demonstrating solidarity with uh, taxpayers and showing uh, that uh, people uh, in the assembly are in tune with the needs of, of Nova Scotians uh, is certainly a way to do that. Uh, and I, I would say that um, focusing on the issues is very important. That's certainly our approach. Um, and I can't really speak further as to uh, specific strategies for political parties uh, on to, as to how to do that. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, uh, Jay. That concludes your time. Um, I would note for the record that you had uh, three, three minutes and 40 seconds left to your original presentation. I did tack that on with the five additional minutes for questions for committee members. So committee members did have uh, eight minutes and 40 seconds to ask questions and answer. And I certainly, uh, on behalf of the committee, want to thank you for taking the time to come in and present to us today. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go to uh, committee members, uh, MLA Lachance. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'd like to propose an amendment. Um, we feel really strongly about um, maintaining a focus on uh, the, the analysis and work that went into the report and particularly thinking about um, how we can increase the representation um, of uh, every Nova Scotian in the House of Assembly. Um, this particular amendment focuses on childcare. I think we've had, um, I think we've known for a long time that childcare is essential uh, for um, supporting folks in the workforce. Um, and we've had a real time experiment on what happens when schools and childcare um, are shuttered as during COVID and how that affects um, in particular women's workforce participation. Um, so with that introduction, perhaps I'll read the amendment out loud. Um, so on page one, clause one, lines five and six, delete uh, subsection and substitute subsections. On page one, clause one, propose subsection 6A, add binding immediately after the first time it appears in the first line. Page one, clause one, add the following subsections immediately after proposed subsection 45A, bracket 6A. 6B, a child care fund is established to reimburse members who are parents for child care expenses incurred during the business of the house pursuant to the to the reducing barriers recommendation in the report pursuant to subsection one following the 2021 general election and dated July 15th, 2022. 6C, the speaker shall determine, shall, the speaker shall administer the child care fund established under subsection 6B and determine the amounts to be paid to eligible members. Um, and I think, you know, I think this is particularly important also thinking about the, the types of hours that we often work in the Legislative Assembly in previous roles, such as with uh, Dalhousie University, um, I did have access to a child care fund if I was working outside normal hours of work. Um, I could claim that expense. Um, and it was a really important part of considering how I could complete my duties during that time. Um, so with that, I'll look forward to discussion on the amendment. Thank you very much, uh, MLA Lachance. We uh, have a motion uh, in front of us. Uh, do we have any discussion? And I'll go to uh, MLA McGuire. I want to thank the honorable member for putting this forward. We'll certainly support this. Um, you know, uh, 
I think childcare. Uh, this so this is part of the bill that, uh, and this is part of the um, report that was put forward. Uh, that's being swept under the table. Um, it's kind of a. It's it's one of those distract things. We've seen this several times uh, with this with this government. Uh, and I'll give you another example of how this works, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they they put forward a bill to protect Nova Scotia ratepayers, and it's similar to what they've done here. They, they protected the solar industry, which was great, uh, but they sure as heck amped, it up, amped up the revenue for Nova Scotia Power, allowing them an extra uh, area of revenue. Um, they also um, did not protect uh, Nova Scotia ratepayers from rate pay increases. Um, and this is similar. This is similar. This bill is very similar to what, what, they're, what they've done in the past. Uh, they take the big, shiny object that they think the public and... Um, God bless the outstanding media in Nova Scotia that they'll that they they'll see uh, they'll see that MLAs are no longer taking rate pay uh, that they're, they're not taking raises but what is what is being buried in this report is that this report specifically addressed um, African Nova Scotian the lack of African Nova Scotian representation the lack of representation from the Mi'kmaq community uh, the Indigenous community which there is um, for the members opposite there is specific legislation for this. And uh, it's never, for, for one reason or another, the, the Mi'kmaq community has never uh, felt part when you have discussion. Chief Dan and Paul lives in my community. I have lots of discussion with him. Um, there's a reason why they don't want to be part of this legislature. And this, this report w wanted to help address that. And these are the things that got swept under the table uh, because they wanted to look like the heroes uh, by not taking the pay rate increase. And to also say that the Premier, this is the first time that a Premier has taken a pay reduction, wrong. Four times a Premier in the history of Nova Scotia has taken a pay reduction. If you want to talk about reduction, Steve McNeil cut the pension. He cut the transition allowance. He cut the benefits. Um, but what he didn't do is then ship it over to his best friends and say, hey, guys, here's $1,800 a day to do what you want to do. Um, so it's a bit... Someone in the legislature used to talk about shell games. Do you remember who that was? I can't remember. Someone used to say this, this is a shell game. This is more than just a shell game. This is 1970s, 80s uh, politics, which was rooted out. And the Nova Scotia used to be known for... Uh, I'm not too young to remember that for the for 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 you know uh, if you knew the right people you'd get a job if you knew the right people you'd get a contract maybe you'd be selling toilet seats automatic toilet seats these are the type of things that Nova Scotia politics used to be known for and governments of all stripe rooted that rot out of the system. And now we're going back to it. And we're getting back to the flashy, shiny politics. The real simple things like, hey, these guys don't deserve a pay raise. None of us asked for a pay raise. In fact, if you did a quick poll of MLAs, we all said no. You didn't have to come back to the legislature for this, Mr. Speaker. You didn't have to drag people in on a hot summer day, the pages, the staff, to do this. All you had to do is wait till the fall session. And yet, here we are. And we have a government and a premier that won't even debate childcare. They won't debate parts of this bill, and parts of this report that will attract more than just, and I'm one of them, well, some of it, middle-aged white men. Because that's what's happening here. People that used to have businesses, that sold their businesses, that have lots of money, that can run. People that are politically connected that 
If they don't get a job, they'll get put somewhere else. And I think all parties are guilty of it, but this party has taken it to a whole new extreme. I think it used to be that the media would have to try to uncover it and go, and go looking. Did so-and-so's friend or, or, or partner get hired? But now it's just, hey, this is what we're doing. And the childcare part of it is extremely important. The proper representation is extremely important. And the reason I bring up those hirees is because my colleague from Barrett myself talked about how two women, which if you know the public sector, a lot of the people in positions of authority are men. Two women were replaced for two close personal friends. It's an ongoing thing. And those women need childcare. They need a childcare. I'm sure they advocated for childcare. I'm sure they had a hard time for proper representation to get where they had to go. But we, we have a premier that will not sit and discuss and debate childcare. We have a premier and representatives across from here that won't talk about real crises. Crises? Crises? Crisis? Crisis, Gary? Crisis or crises? To the chair, please. Sorry, i just going to the wordsmith over here. Uh, the won't talk about real crisis in Nova Scotia. And those are the things that impact whether people are going to run or not. But they're also the things that disillusion individuals from voting. When they don't see proper representation, when they know that, I think of just from my own personal experience when it comes to childcare, um, and we know that it's the, traditionally it's the women that bear the brunt of this, and I look at my own household, uh, my, my partner who uh, had a fantastic job, had worked her entire life to get where she was at. Um, because of lack of childcare, and affordable childcare, um, she stayed home, her choice. I, listen, I offered to stay home too. I mean, it's just how it goes. And she not only lost her job, but lost her earnings by tens of thousands of dollars. And she's just now, my oldest is nine years old, she's just now back to where she was. And we saw from this government, somebody voted no. Because we know on this side, from the liberals and from the NDP, none of us voted no. And if you don't believe me, I put my vote online. I challenge every single one of you to go to the clerk and say, publicly release our votes. Because somebody voted no on child care. Somebody voted no to allow a woman who just had a traumatic C-section birth. Most of you cry when you stub your toe. I see members out of the house for way less than that. You got a cough, you don't want to come into work. But you told a member who was elected in a landslide, a two-term MLA, that she had to be here after having a C-section and then made a political stunt of it. That's the worst part about it all, one of the worst parts. So I don't think, I don't think this is... Uh, <laughs> I, I just, I'm just blown away by the lack of empathy. And this was something that was said by one of the MLAs the other day. And if you vote this down, it again shows the lack of empathy and the one-sided male mind of the progressive, con oh, sorry, I just said progressive, of the Conservative Party of Nova Scotia. They keep, you keep saying you're progressive, but when progressive, when progressive ideas come forward from both the NDP and the Liberals, you vote it down, there's smiles, there's chuckles, there's, you know. So if you want to earn 
the name progressive conservative, how about voting for childcare? How about voting for <laughs> Mi'kmaq representation in the Nova Scotia legislature? Nation to nation relationship building. I'll bet you $5 each that none of you vote yes because I'm going to call a revo recorded vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, MLA McGuire. Uh, MLA Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll speak to the subject at hand and try to keep it on topic and not go on for 15 or 20 minutes on things that don't really relate to what we're talking about here in Bill 185. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island for bringing forward this important motion. Um, I will be saying that we won't be supporting it, but only because we have so much other important work going on with respect to child care in this province. Um, we have 1,500 new child care um, facilities that are going to be created by the end of the year. Um, we are on track to get to $10 a day daycare across the province. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, we recognize the importance of child care. We have important work on the go that is going to get to a place where child care is affordable for all Nova Scotians, not just targeting MLAs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, uh, MLA Boudreau, did you have a comment? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was I was going to speak to some of the similar um, uh, points that uh, my my colleague mentioned, but but I also just wanted to to make note that what we're what we're here for today is about the binding uh, binding parts of of the that's what our bill is about is about the binding uh, recommendations from from the report that needed to be done in a timely fashion, and that is what we're here for, and that's what our government has brought forward. There are non-binding ones that I, I believe. You know, our premier has said, um, you know, he wants to take a look at. And so, you know, at this point, this is what our focus has been, has been on the bonding parts. And so with all with with respect to 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 what's been put forward, our focus is on that. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll uh, go to MLA Lachance, please. Um, so uh, thank you for engaging on the amendment. I guess, you know, I think to address the first comments, I think we're talking about actually two different things and they're not conflictual. So if you have a look at the report, what we're talking about is representation and, uh, and you know, we are thrilled uh, to have universal childcare. We've been fighting for that for decades. So, um, so absolutely, um, you know, support efforts and, you know, and want to see, for instance, like the EC uh, wage framework release. So that is, absolutely essential that's actually not that that belief in universal child care is that the principle behind this but actually also this this motion this amendment um, draws its principles um, around diversity and equity and inclusion in representation so um, certainly we're talking about the ability for MLAs who are parents um, to meet the the rather unusual expectations of this role in terms of uh, time in the house, but also time when we're in our constituencies and we're you know, out in the evenings. I mean, I, I know a number of you have still have youngish children who uh, may require, uh, still require some childcare. Um, you know, we need to be able to, we're expected to be available uh, 24 7 so whether we're in the house or not whether and, and even really more so when we're in our constituency and we need the ability to be able to respond and I certainly never saw the possibility of being able to run for office when my children were little I could not have imagined that um, because I couldn't imagine how I would have the child care that I needed um, accessible to me or be able to afford it um, it would have been too expensive to be, have been talking to folks about the need for child care in evenings and weekends. Um, and our amendment uh, takes us, you know, a, a child care fund, uh, but I would love a chance at a future date to talk about the particular needs of children with, with disabilities and their parents and their families, which differ um, extensively from the average needs of folks um, with children who require child care. So, this in no way detracts from your efforts um, uh, around implementing child care. In fact, we, you know, uh, you have a minister working on that, um, and this is a, this is wholly a different 
um, issue. I think in terms of um, you know what this legislation is supposed to do or not do, so I think we've pretty well established that there was actually no need to end up into this in, in this situation where we're meeting in the summer because of the binding parts of the legislation. Um, that hasn't been that hasn't been necessary over the last few years. It certainly wasn't necessary this year. It was no surprise, um, and and this all could have been averted. Um, my concern by that comment is that, you know, that we're going to forget the other 300 and some pages of this report, which raise really critical issues. You know, I am, you know, you know, we are sitting there in the NDP with uh, a range of, of parents with 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 uh, children of different ages, um, but lots of young children, um, and you know, we can see, you know, why and how the barriers arise when you. Um, you know, need access to child care that is responsive and appropriate for your family situation. So, I, I you know, I'm disappointed, um, actually, that you would call this house back and actually not spend some time on the other critical issues being raised in that report, binding or not binding. Um, you know, this is the time now to think ahead to 2025. And who do we want to be able to attract? Who do we want to see in the legislature? In 2025, we have a dismal, dismal record on diversity in Nova Scotia in the House of Assembly, and we need to do better. Thank you, uh, MLA Lachant. I believe MLA Tilly, and then me, Brad. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Um, Thank you to uh, the member for putting this amendment together. Um, I will be supporting it for sure. Um, I just wanted to address some of the comments around uh, why, why we're here and why we're not here. We are here because um, at the end of the day, um, a committee was struck. A committee was struck to review um, pay and compensation for MLAs. That committee was supposed to be struck within 60 days of the election, which would have been end of October. Um, it, it didn't, for whatever reason that I'm unaware of. However, we did go through um, two sessions of legislation, both about five to six weeks, where this issue could have been dealt with uh, very quickly um, by not, uh, by, by putting a bill together at that time that said we weren't going to, to call this uh, committee together, which is how it's been done in the past. And I think if that had been done, uh, we wouldn't be in this position today. So that's kind of just the facts of, of the situation. Now, um, I understand um, it has been done. Great work has been done by this committee. And and the fact that we're, we're here just dealing with the binding part with respect to my colleagues, um, that is true. However, I think it's important when a bill is on the table that um, there's opportunities for collaboration with other, with other parties to put ideas forward um, that actually came from the hard work of, of this panel of, of people who, who you know, put um, a significant amount of work into something uh, is over 300 pages report and it's going to get mothballed which is a shame and it's just um, the respect for their work um, I think we owe it uh, to the committee we owe it to Nova Scotians and we owe it to um, people who are considering a run uh, to become an MLA that we're we do whatever we can to support them so I just want to be on the record to um, to indicate uh, why I think we should support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, MLA Tilly. Uh, any other questions for? Call the question. uh, I'll go to uh, MLA McGuire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I mean, I'm disappointed too, but I'm not surprised. Um, you know, this is this was a public relations stunt. We know that. I think they thought they could come in and, and, and get a bump in the polls. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that um, there are real crisis and real emergencies in Nova Scotia that they're just quite frankly not willing to speak about. Um, I challenge anyone to go through Hansard and see how many times the members opposite 
um, the premier, the uh, the the um, community services minister, the minister of finance. How many times they've actually stood up to to talk about the real issues? And instead, what they do is they pat themselves on the back and they say, "We're going to give you one hundred fifty dollars." Um, and this. Instead of giving money to his close personal friends, he could have gave it to child Mr. care. Mr. McGuire. Uh, child MLA care. MLA McGuire. Yeah. Um, there's Please. That's on topic. Money being spent on one thing and not being spent on child care is on topic. I mean, the members opposite might not want to hear it, but that's the truth. And they talked about binding issues. Well, the relationship, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship between Nova Scotians and the Mi'kmaq community is binding. And it's extremely disrespectful to that community, to that nation, when you refuse to even acknowledge it in the legislature and brush it aside. Another binding relationship is the relationship between a parent Ms. and their child. Mr. McGuire, this Emily is McGuire, if I could please. So just because you throw in the, the word child care or parent or child or whatever does not mean that you don't you're have necessarily the right to decide on that. topic. So I it would ask topic. you to please respectfully Mind your say, business, I'm talking to him. Excuse me, MLA McGuire. I would ask you to please try to stay on topic, okay? I don't Thank know you. how else to stay on topic than use the word child care. And maybe if, if you want to sit there and chirp, MLA Maybe you McGuire can stand up and has talk. the floor. MLA okay. McGuire, excuse me. MLA McGuire has the floor. MLA McGuire, please stay on topic. Thank you. Literally, the amendment says the word, word child care in it. And I'm talking about the relationship between a parent and their child. That is child care. I don't know how you define child care, but that's how I define child care. MLA McGuire to the chair. I don't understand. Maybe that's Thank not how you. You, the members opposite define child care, but that's how I define child care. And all was happening now, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chair, is the members opposite don't want to hear. They only want to hear what they want to hear. And the fact of the matter is, is that we could be in this legislature going through this, recommend, these recommendations, and picking out what's best for Nova Scotians. But instead, they just want to stick to what could potentially give them points in the polls, and that's the pay side of it. They don't want to talk about giving parents an opportunity to be represented in this legislature. And you know how I know? You know how I know? It's not just this. You know how I know, frankly, that I don't think this government cares about child care? Is they keep calling sessions till midnight over anything, over anything, knowing perfectly well that parents have to go home and, and be with their children. But most of them, their, their children are grown or they, you know, they don't have to worry about that. And for the member for Eastern Shore to talk about, Mr. Chair, for the member of Eastern Shore to talk about child care agreement, how dare you? That government, the government, when Mr. Speaker, when they were in opposition, voted against that budget. The federal liberals brought that in, and the provincial liberals signed the agreement. We were the first province in Canada to sign a child care agreement, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, sorry. And the government of the now voted against it. And now they're patting themselves on the back saying, oh my God, we brought in child care. You didn't do anything. In fact, you tried to prevent it. You tried to prevent bringing in child care in this province, $10 a day child care. And then once the agreement was signed, you made an even bigger mess of it. 
And now you won't even discuss childcare for MLAs. You won't discuss opening doors and allowing access for diversity and more women in this legislature. And as I said, they're going to vote against it and they're going to go back, Mr. Speaker, to their, Mr. Chair, sorry, they're going to go back to their constituencies, they're going to go back to their communities, and they're going to spin it, they're going to stand on those doorsteps, Mr. Speaker, and they're going to say, well, the Liberals this and the NDP that. That's, that's not how this works. You are an adult, you're a grown-up, you know this is the right thing to do. But you're not putting your constituents before the party. Maybe you want to get ahead. Maybe you want to be in cabinet. Maybe you want other things, Mr. Speaker. But you're going to vote against it. You're going to vote against parents in Nova Scotia. You're going to vote against single parents. You're going to vote against access to democracy in this province because you want to curry some favor and be a close personal friend of the Premier. And that's all I have to say. We have a uh, motion to call for the question. Um, so I have had uh, MLA LaChance has spoke twice on this. Um, no um, so I do have a motion on the floor to call for the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, MLA uh, Burrow. Uh, I, I can't see any interest, uh, constructive interest, that would be served by uh, uh, calling the question at this point when uh, MLA Lachance, the mover of the amendment, uh, clearly has something to say in response to a vigorous discussion. Uh, so I think it, uh, it would not serve uh, the interest that the committee has gathered for it for us to move to the question until MLA Lachance has had a chance to speak. So I would like to speak against the motion that we call the question uh, prior to MLA Lachance's speaking. Thank you uh, very much for your comments, MLA Burrell. I'll go to MLA Lachance, who I saw next, and then was her... I, 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 I will withdraw. I, I, my original uh, request was. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so I would re recognize uh, MLA Burrell, please. I mean uh, Boudreau. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I did. I did have my hand up previously to call the question uh, beforehand, but I did not see her hand. But okay. I, 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 or sorry, mix uh, MLA Lachance's hand up, but. Um, if, if Emily Lachance has something to say, but I would I would like to call the question ap after that. Okay. Well. Okay. So I guess this is a mute. Uh, yes. Okay. So thank you very much, Mr. Burrell, for your comments. I guess they're kind of mute, <laughs> and we'll go to uh, Emily Lachance, please. I called you Burrell again. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I I think really actually that whole interaction. Um, it was a good example of what I wanted to bring to the table. And that is, um, you know, I am deeply disappointed that we've been called back to only deal with one part of the legislation that we are all in support of, or one part of the report that we're all in support of, um, which is not taking um, an MLA pay raise at this point. Um, and yet, there's absolutely no appetite and seemingly no capacity to consider any of the other really important aspects of the report. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm super disappointed uh, around the comments that the Premier will take it into consideration. I mean, actually, you know what? I, I, I guess I would expect, I read the report, I hope you all read the report, um, because I also think this is the responsibility of all MLAs. And, um, you know, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I continue to be surprised by the lack of collaboration on the other side, from the from the other side of the table, um, in terms of even taking a moment to consider whether or not uh, what's being brought forward on this side of the table has value um, and is rooted in really important principles. So, you know, I guess I would consider as we 
I would encourage you all as we move forward to consider how to uh, bring forward your principles um, to equity, diversity, and inclusion in the work that you do in the legislature um, and not wait um, necessarily for others to lead that way. Um, and, um, you know, and I don't disagree with my colleague, uh, Emily McGuire, that, that, you know, so it's unclear to me when we're going to talk about any of the other aspects of the report. I don't understand when that's going to be, and I would love to hear if there's a timeline plan and who's responsible for it. That would be fantastic. So I don't know, know that. But I think the clear message that Nova Scotians are getting, and particularly that um, women and gender diverse folks are getting this week in Nova Scotia, is that you can be a, C, uh, a leader of an organization hired on merit um, and, and hopefully having performance reviews based on merit and be turfed um, for, uh, through nepotism uh, for Premier's friends, um, that we don't, that the PCs don't want to talk about child care and don't want to consider other aspects around diversity. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I guess I just really, you know, and at the same time also want to silence discussion about these important issues. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, I, I, if you have a sense of who's responsible and who's going to look at the different aspects of the report and when we can expect to see um, additional legislation, hopefully in the fall, um, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Call for a question on the amendment that's before us. Uh, we have a request for a recorded vote. So I will uh, start with uh, the government side uh, with uh, Emily Boudreaux, please. Uh, no. Emily Palmer. No. MLA Smith? No. MLA Ritzy? No. Uh, Chair, no. MLA Tilly? Yes. MLA McGuire? Yes. MLA Lachance? Yes. MLA Burr? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, that's 5 4 against, uh, the mo against the motion. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion on the, or, uh, uh, on the main? Uh, motion. Uh, there's another change sheet. Yeah. Okay. We do have another change sheet coming forward. Uh, while uh, that's being passed out, do do we want to take a two or three minute uh, break, or is everybody okay? Everybody okay? I had my Wheaties this morning. Okay. So we'll continue then. Thank you. Yeah, so we are pausing for, for a break and uh, we'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, call the committee back from recess. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, we do have a, uh, a motion in front of us for an amendment. And uh, is it uh, MLA McGuire's bringing this forward? MLA McGuire, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is bill number 185, House Assembly Act amended, changes recommended. Our page one, clause one, line five and six, delete subsection and substitute subsections. Uh, page one, clause one, proposed subsection 6A, add binding immediately after, binding immediately after the first time it appears in the first line. Page one, clause one, add the following subsection immediately after proposed subsection 45A, bracket 6A, bracket. Uh, 6B, the House shall in accordance with the non-binding recommendations to reduce barriers in the per, uh, report pursuant to subsection 1 following the 2021 general election and dated July 15, 2022. A, establish a fund that is accessible to all members who are parents to provide reimbursement for child care expenses incurred during the business of the House and subsection or and B, practice nation-to-nation -nation relationship building and consult Mi'kmaq legal scholars to revisit and further the intention pursuant to Section 6 to include as an additional member a person who represents the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll be quick on this one uh, because I've already said a lot. Um, but the truth is, is that... Um, so we have a uh, motion on the floor. We'll go to debate on this motion, starting off with MLA McGuire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we've had some discussion here today about what's binding, what's non-binding, what's important about this report and what's not important about this report, why we're here this week and why we're not here for the next few weeks. Um, but the truth is, is that um, a lot of work was done. Um, again, I will say that this government, Mr. Speaker, chose the shiny apple. They chose the low-hanging fruit that they thought they'd get the most public relations on, and they have chosen not to talk about or even debate why our legislature is made up of the way it is and why it looks the way it looks. I feel that, part of me feels that if this full report was implemented that it would potentially impact their chances and they're looking at it politically. It's the reason why we now have a summer election. They saw it as advantageous. So they can react, and they can put things in that really help them. We, we've, saw them we've seen them react quickly um, to certain things, certain things like election days, uh, firing of civil servants, implementation of close personal friends, things like that. But when it comes to child care, when it comes to uh, relation to rela nation to nation relationship and, and the very important recommendations, they want to think about it a little more. Um, they won't give us a time frame. Um, the member from um, Halifax Citadel requested a time frame. Um, I don't think they know. I mean, the members here certainly probably don't know. Um, but I would, I would guess that they're just going to push this down the road till people forget about it and never to hear from it again. And I don't know why they would need to have more consultation and, and more thought on this when they themselves appointed the members of this committee to do this report. And they spent a lot of time and a lot of money to, to come back with the recommendations. And quite frankly, uh, the witness here today, Mr. Pratt, had a great idea. Um, instead of, we know that we're, we're well compensated. We know that um, our compensation is much higher than the average Nova Scotian. So nobody in the Nova Scotia legislature is asking for more money. But it was kind of a, a, a neat idea to say, like, hey, why not take that money? Um, instead of creating positions for your friends, give that to not-for-profits and associations that need it. 
food banks and uh, soup kitchens that have skyrocketed. The uses have, usage has skyrocketed over the last year. We know that. That's a real crisis. MLA pay is not a real crisis. It, it just really isn't. And it's very frustrating to have to continue to talk and, and repeat myself and, and say these things over and over. Uh, it's demoralizing. And, you know, when, when you know that it's just falling on deaf ears and nobody wants to, nobody wants to acknowledge it. And so what that says to me is they're, this, this government, Mr. Speaker, is perfectly content of the makeup of this legislature. They're, they're perfectly content of the restrictions that are in place. They're perfectly content with um, the roadblocks for families, for low-income people to become MLAs. Um, they're perfectly content that there is, there is actually supposed to be Mi'kmaq representation in the Nova Scotia legislature. And listen, I'll be the first to say that I wish that all three levels of government, whenever, or sorry, all three parties, when they're in power, um, should have did something about that. And, and nobody did. But now we have a report coming back that said, let's fix this. Let's find out why. And I would say that this is a, go a government, um, like all governments, that want to do things that are politically advantageous. Uh, this is politically advantageous for you to figure out how to get the proper representation. So you don't have to put a 70-year-old or 60-year-old gentleman as African Nova Scotian representation, white male. Like, that was, ins you know, I I've spoken to leaders in the African Nova Scotian community. That was insulting. The gentleman is fine. The minister is an excellent person, love him to death, great guy. But it's very hard for people to have faith in the systems we have when they don't see themselves properly represented. We see that in the justice system, Mr. Speaker, and I know you, you've worked hard to fix that, and previous governments are working hard to fix that, but you know. Everybody knows if, if you don't see yourself reflected, you don't see your culture, you don't see your beliefs reflected in, in our, our government systems, then you're not going to believe in it. You're not going to have faith in it. You're not going to have faith that you're going to have proper representation. So when you go to communities and you talk to them about what do you think about government, what do you think about what's happening down at the Nova Scotia legislature, they're just, psh, they're not me. That's not who I am. And there's a, I, would, I would argue that every single person here that represents your community are great people. Uh, we do have our back and forth. I, I'll, be, I'll put it on the record. I know that I get under some people's skin, uh, and that's fine. Um, but uh, part of the job is to, to point out where the failures are and where the good things that are happening. And I've, I've stood up in this legislature, and I've said, these things are great. What you've done is great. But I've also stood up and said, and I've got a big round of applause. Yay! But the moment I tell you that something that's being done is not properly representing the community that I represent, that I have the privilege to be part of, I'm a villain. Right? And that's not fair. It's not fair because we can't, I can't just be the voice for the 40, mid 40 year old white guy, I have to be the voice for everyone. And that means listening to them. And that's exactly what this report did. So for this government, it's one thing to say that we're going to look at it, we're going to do this. But there's, there's no time frames. There's nothing. You know, uh, very quickly ran out and, and put a fixed election date. That was advantageous to them. This is something that you can do if you, if you just add it access to child care and proper representation. I mean, it's something that 20 years down the road when we're no longer in this job, you can look at yourself and you can look around and say, yeah, I did that. We did that. I'm proud of that. And there's going to be many moments that you're going to be proud of. 
And you probably won't remember this debate. You probably won't even remember me, and that's fine. But who will remember is the Mi'kmaq Nation, African Nova Scotians, and women that are not being properly supported. And these amendments will properly support them. And I plead and beg with you to please vote yes on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGuire. I do have a speaker's list. Uh, okay. Uh, I think MLA LaChance was there, and then I'll come back to you, MLA Ritzy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, I'm pleased to uh, speak in support of this amendment. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I've articulated, uh, hopefully we've articulated well, the need um, to consider childcare as a, really as a cornerstone um, for ensuring um, diversity, equity, and inclusion of, of folks in Nova Scotia who could become our elected officials. Um, in terms of um, also, uh, you know, moving forward in terms of Mi'kmaq representation um, in the House of Assembly, I, I do think it's, it's actually really, it is um, a shame that we, we all bear in, in terms of our, you know, um, our representation that the, you know, the, we're on the original, the unceded territories of Mi'kmaq people, and yet there's never been uh, Mi'kmaq representation in the House. Um, I think uh, we didn't put forward this particular specific amendment um, just because you know we would prefer this to come forward after a consultation with uh, Mi'kmaq leaders and with the Mi'kmaq community um, so that we, we get it right. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know the the there's a lot of work that's been ongoing um, around reconciliation that we need to be able to support. Um, but, you know, I, again, uh, you know, I come back to, you know, the importance of these principles and, but yet seeing no hurry from the other side of the table in terms of actually addressing this as a, as a critical need. And, um, you know, I think that speaks to the cycle of who gets elected. So um, maybe this doesn't seem like a priority to the other side of the house. Maybe folks haven't read all the parts of the report. That's because it doesn't matter to many of the folks on the other side of the house, like in terms of um, barriers around race, um, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation haven't been factors in how um, uh, members have been able to uh, organize and live their lives. So we're just perpetuating a cycle. If we don't actually make progress, um, around representation in the House, then you know the same voices are heard, um, and um, the same issues are prioritized, and that certainly shapes you know shapes the public and the media discourse around what's happening in our province. So, um, you know, I guess again, I would just return to um, this feeling that you know we're back to discuss the recommendations of the report. Um, and uh, you know, some are binding or not, but we actually don't have a sense of where the government stands on the other issues in the report, um, who's responsible for them, and what the timeline is for bringing forward um, legislative responses to what else is outlined uh, in the report. Um, so, with that, you know, um, you know, I. Uh, I, un I understand we sit in this committee and uh, the other side doesn't want to accept any amendments. Um, and you know whether those are ideas from speakers who appear um, or uh, from, from you know, the opposition members. But um, you know, I think really hearing from the government in terms of a, a commitment to specific issues and timelines would go a long way uh, in, in making sure that this session hasn't been um, hasn't been for naught. So, thank you very much, MLA Lachance. Uh, go to MLA Ritzy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question. I know he has his hand up after, so he can answer it then. Uh, my first question, really, is um, has has when you brought this amendment forward, did you did you consult at all with to the chair, please? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. 
uh, through to the member, uh, did you consult with the, uh, the, the Mi'kmaq leadership at all? And that, look forward to your answer on that. But also, our cabinet in the most recent weeks have met with First Nation uh, leaders across the province. And, uh, you know, this did not come up in the area of, for priority for them uh, at that time. So uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just curious to uh, if the consultation did happen before bringing the amendment to the, to the floor. Thank you, uh, MLA Ritzy. Next on my list is MLA McGuire. Good timing. So I would say, uh, let me rehash the, uh, the amendment. It is literally says, practice nation, nation relationship building, and consult Mi'kmaq legal scholars. So the amendment is actually to consult with the Mi'kmaq community and the nation to find out why they have the ability to have representation in Nova Scotia, and it's not happening. And I know the member uh, quite well. Uh, we'll say I think he's a fantastic person. Um, but the truth is, is I know you said that this did not come up. So I would be a little puzzled. Like, I would be a little concerned. Like, why did this not come up? Like, why did the government not bring it up? Why are they? Why are the Mi'kmaq community, the nation, not bringing it up? Um, and that's part of why we 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 want the consultation. Because there's an ability for them, for their nation to be represented. And they're not even. They don't even want to speak about it as per the member's statement. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think this is. It's important to figure out why and how we can make the Nova Scotia legislature more accessible and more diverse. Um, we, you know, we hit a million people in Nova Scotia. We want to hit two million people in Nova Scotia. Um, and the truth is, is that's going to, that's going to be a lot of new immigrants into this province. So if we want to double the population in Nova Scotia, <coughs> surely we want to make sure that those people are represented in the communities. Like, I'm very proud of, like, looking around at some of the members that I've had to serve with, not just on our side, but on all sides uh, over the last umpteen years that I've been here. Um, and and I, I think, you know, we, we talk about, this, this isn't saying you have to have the representation. It's just saying, like, and, and that's the other thing. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to pass this amendment. It's just saying, like, Hey, let's consult. Let's let's sit down as government. Go forward and consult with them and find out why. Why? What can we do to make this gosh, this legislature more appealing to make it more I'm right. I just I mean it's like banging my uh, Anyways. Maybe we were the same way, okay? And maybe that's what this is, a little bit of a little bit of payback. I don't know what it is at this point, but God, if we were the same way, I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, MLA McGuire. So I would uh, now call for the question on the amendments. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, I'm sorry, uh, MLA Smith. You were on, you were on my I list. I was. Thank you. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'd recognize MLA Smith, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just a few comments uh, on the amendment. Uh, number one, um, the member for Halifax Atlantic talked about things that we didn't work quickly on, and I just wanted to, to highlight the fact that you know we worked extremely quickly on CCA raises. We worked extremely quickly on to, the amendment, to uh, offering jobs for nurses, and we worked very quickly on putting the most program in in place. Um, the member for Halifax Atlantic also said that uh, we picked the panel that, that put together the the report and actually each caucus was able to select one member of the panel. Um, and so to, to the amendment, when we talk about child care, we've obviously talked about that and how we believe that every Nova Scotian deserves access to, to child care and that's the work that we're doing through the Department of Early Childhood uh, Education, Early Childhood Development. And when we talk about the First, Nation, First Nations consultation, of course, uh, we'll, we will work on that and I think that it's, it's transparent that our government has been uh, has been very, very um, committed to doing what we can to repair the relationship 
that was broken uh, with the first people of this of this province and of this country. Um, and Minister McFarland is ongoing dialogue with the with the local chiefs. So, um, all of that said, well, we're not going to be supporting this amendment, but we we are going to carry on the good work that Minister McFarland has started with the First Nations people. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you very Chairman. much, uh, MLA Smith. Uh, you can, yeah. Okay. So the question's been called for, uh, and uh, I will uh, move the question now. So all those that are in, all those that are in favor of. Uh, thank you. We will. We we have it called for a. Uh, we have it called for a recorded vote. So uh, we will. So. You're making this partisan. Thank you. Thank you. And for clarification of uh, MLA McGuire, and I think. I think we went through this last time, yeah. um, and uh, it went to the speaker, and the speaker said that uh, management of the committee is up to the chair. Um, I've I've given everybody adequate time to uh, to speak on on the uh, the motion, unless there is a speaker who has not spoken yet. Uh, I'm going to go to the moving of the uh, question. So is there a speaker? So I will recognize uh, MLA Tilly. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just I want to go on the record to to say that uh, I don't think um, the ruling of the chair was was fair in this particular case. The member the member had his hand up long before. Um, There's no debate on the chair. Do you have the floor? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so the member had his hand up long before the member called for the question. And um, I, I believe he has, he has the right to speak. It is his amendment. Um, so similar to um, MLA Burrell, I, I'm speaking against the motion um, to call for the question to allow um, Mr. McGuire, or sorry, to allow the member for Halifax Atlantic to finish his point and uh, and then then certainly we'll allow call for the question. Thank okay. you. Thank you, MLA Tilly. Uh, anyone else who's not spoke no. on this motion? He's speaking against the motion that he just called, so we're allowed to speak on that now. Uh, uh, I recognize MLA McGuire on the motion that's yeah. currently yeah. here. So I'm just going to be quick. Uh, what time is it? Uh, I, I just think that again, what I wanted to say uh, to to is that you can't say we're not going to accept something that's good because we've done X, Y, Z. It's just a silly thing to, to say, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, this is what we're seeing now is we're seeing like when good ideas come forward, um, we're seeing, well, we're not going to do that idea because, you know, um, we, we just so happen to be in a room with somebody or we just so happen to walk by someone or we just, we passed this over here or we just, we did this. Like, uh, it's, it's exactly why people get so frustrated. When, when positive ideas come forward, um, they're, they're, they're saying we're not going to do this because of X, Y, Z. And most of it have nothing to actually do with, like this, it, uh, this is not, there's, there's no negative blowback from the from this amendment except for like there's there's literally MLA McGuire on topic of whether or not well, uh, the motion should, should be put please that's you, you certainly where didn't we keep are. your 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 MLA your caucus made on topic on the motion that whether or not we should put this now please thank you well uh, what i would say is i think that uh, this this committee has become far too political it's come, become par too, far too partisan, um, and the role of the chair is supposed to act as a nonpartisan individual, um, and that's been thrown out the window. Thank you for your comments, MLA McGuire. MLA Lachance, were you on the list? Yes. Thank you. I'd recognize MLA Lachance on the motion as to whether or not the amendment be now put. Yes, yeah, so I'm speaking on the motion to put the amendment to the question. And I... And I guess, uh, you know, I wanted to weigh in on this because um, I think 
uh, one if not two of the incidents that happened in the last session uh, were the result of, of me taking concerns um, back to the speaker. And certainly, um, you know, the, the role of the chair of the committee was clarified. So, so you, you know, we do need to be able to bring concerns about committee management to you as the chair. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, value the work of this committee. Um, I think it's really important to be able to hear um, from folks in the community on proposed legislation, but then also have a chance to consider that um, amongst ourselves and to have a, a fulsome discussion. So uh, I get, you know, as a matter of principle, I would uh, really resist um, actions of, of the chair and, and, um, and actions of members that would seek to limit debate um, on these critical issues. We've been brought back um, uh, in an emergency setting because, uh, session because this is of you know, great public interest. And I think it's our due diligence to consider the issue at hand. And that includes not just the legislation that's been developed by government that only focuses on one aspect of this report, but all issues raised in that report. So um, I'm not in agreement with calling the question, and I think that uh, continually silencing committee members is a dangerous precedent. Thank you very much for your comment. Any other comment, uh, discussion on the motion now be put? So those that are in favor of having the motion now put, uh, we've request for a recorded vote starting with uh, MLA Boudreau. Yes. MLA Palmer. Yes. Motion to put. Yes. To call call the vote. Put. Yeah. yeah. So uh, MLA Boudreau was yes. MLA Palmer. Yes. Thank you. MLA Smith. Yes, to call the vote. Thank you. MLA Ritzy. Yes, to call the vote. Uh, chair says yes. MLA Tilly. No. Thank you. MLA McGuire. No. Thank you. MLA Lachance. No. Thank you. And MLA Burrow. No. Thank you. Uh, five to call the, or to have the question now put. Four against having the question put. Move to uh, the amendment that's on the floor. So we ask uh, those that are in. A request for a recorded vote on the amendment. Uh, so for committee members, this is the LAC Lib 1. Um, so I would go to uh, MLA Boudreaux. No. Thank you. MLA Palmer. No. MLA Smith. No. Thank you. MLA Ritzy. No. Uh, chair is no. MLA Tilly. Yes. Thank you. MLA McGuire. Yes. Thank you. MLA Lachance? Yes. Thank you. And MLA Burrow? Yes. Thank you. Um, so that uh, five no's, four yeses, and we'll move to uh, look for a motion now. I'll go to uh, MLA Ritzy, please. Uh, I, I move the Bill 185 House of Assembly Act amended reported to be reported back to the committee of the whole house without amendments. Uh, motion on the floor. All those in favor signify with aye. aye. Uh, record it vote, please. Uh, Emily Boudra. Yes. Thank you. Emily Palmer. Yes. Thank you. Emily Smith. Yes. Thank you. Emily Ritzy. Yes. Thank you. Chair is yes. Emily Tilly. No. Thank you. Emily McGuire. Thank you. MLA Lachance? No. Thank you. And MLA Burr? No. Okay. Thank you. Five, four, four against. Um, and uh, so we'll move that forward. Thank you. And with that, we will uh, conclude our business. Thank you. <laughs>